This lecture is on the foot and ankle. So uh, first, osteology always. So I'm gonna go over a few uh, major landmarks and aspects of the bones, um, but otherwise, for the most part, you should pretty much guess that, um, or assume that uh, the anatomy of the bones and the muscles should definitely be an area where you study. I don't need to run through and talk about all the straight up facts that exist for all the muscles. That is definitely something you can work on. And of course I can answer any questions, but I'm not gonna spend time just talking about that. So I'm gonna point out a few important things about the bones. <laughs> so first, let's look at the lateral view here. <clears throat> So let's just, this is the right foot. So we're looking at the outside of this foot. And what I really wanna draw attention to is the subtalar joint. So that is in green. This joint between the talus and the calcaneus called the subtalar joint is where we get our inversion and eversion occurring in our foot. So we have our inversion and eversion occurring at the subtalar joint. So we'll scroll up here to look at our talocrural joint, which is a combination of the tibia and fibula here with the talus. So if you look over to the right side, you can see where we have where that talus is gonna be. Okay, and this is how we get, so this is our talocrural joint. And this is how we get our dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So we need to know the bones that articulate to make these joints for multiple reasons. One of which is because on the practicals, you're gonna be asked to name those. So hopefully we don't ask you, uh, hopefully you just tell us what bones articulate to make the joint that you're measuring. Um, so when I talk about in the palpation video, you have your lateral malleolus over here on the left. It's a crucial landmark for our axis of the goniometer. <clears throat> also want to point out the anterior tibiofibular ligament. So we're going to be talking about uh, some different ligaments on this lateral side that help hold the fibula to the tibia. And then on the medial side, we have our medial malleolus, which is part of the tibia. So our lateral malleolus is part of the fibula. Medial malleolus is part of the tibia. Going back down to this lateral view here. So moving our way forward in this. Uh, again, in the palpation video, I talk about the styloid process of the fifth metatarsal. So it's gonna be a good landmark that then helps you find the cuboid. So make sure you watch that video. Then you follow along that fifth metatarsal as we work our way down here and you get to what's called the MTP joints, metatarsophalangeal joints. So this is when you get up on the balls of your feet, so to speak, those are the joints that you're on. Following that, you have your PIP, so the proximal interphalangeal joint. And then the DIP is the distal interphalangeal joint. Your big toe or halicus only has one, and then that's simply put as IP, interphalangeal joint. Let's go take a look here at our medial side. So with that medial side, you're going to, on this side is where you're going to have the tibia, so you're gonna have your medial malleolus kind of right around in here. And then you should be able to see this talus right here. And see how that sits right in between the fibula and tibia. So you should be able to find the navicular tuberosity and we'll work on that in lab. And then directly in front of that, you're gonna have your medial cuneiform followed by that first metatarsal all the way down. Let's get to some of those ligaments here. So on that lateral side, 
the major ligament that we have issues with that gets damaged the most is our anterior talofibular ligament. A lot of times you'll see that ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament. Now these names can sound a little confusing at first, but the names literally tell you what's being connected. Talo, talus, and fibula. So we have the talus and fibula connected here, holding that together. Some other parts of this, you're gonna have the calcaneofibular ligament and the posterior talofibular ligament. When someone has an inversion sprain, so your classic ankle sprain, generally, oh, sprain, sprain, these are the ligaments that get damaged, and the main one is your anterior talofibular ligament. On the medial side, usually people do not have inversion sprains. So the deltoid ligament, uh, one of the reasons why is because the deltoid ligament is so big. If you look at this thing, look at all of this ligamentous structure here. It's a lot of stability versus over here, you can see there's plenty of gaps in between. This allows for a lot of motion, but when you have a lot of motion, you're more susceptible to injury at the same time. So there's some key parts to uh, look at when looking at some basic osteology and some of the ligaments that help hold those bones together. So going back to the notes here, talked about the ATFL, talked about posterior talofibular and calcanofibular ligaments. Now there's special tests. So These are tests that the PT performs to see if something's injured. Now we will get into a little bit more of this about how these tests are not very reliable, especially immediately following an injury and usually all show positive, even though they're not. So, um, but that's, that's a whole nother story. And the PT does those tests anyway. You can learn how to do those. And if your PT is cool with that, you can do them, but you will never document the results of a special test. That is solely for the PT but there are two special tests here to test for damage of that ligament. One is the Taylor tilt test. <clears throat> and I'll get a link to some videos for you uh, that are actually in your lab packet that can show you that. Plus you can look this up online. I highly recommend physio tutors. I'll write that down. That's where I get all my links. Physio tutors on YouTube, those guys do a real good job of quick, short videos that tell you what's going on. And then the anterior drawer test, which is literally gonna be drawing that foot forward. So if we look at, we can show you this in lab. We go back to the ligaments here. If you were to grab this foot and pull it forward, you would be stretching, whoa, not yellow. You would be stretching this ligament. So if you have damage here and you pull that apart, it's going to hurt. So that's what the anterior tilt test is doing. The Taylor tilt test is a way to try to differentiate between damage here, here, or here. So, but I'll, like I said, there's links in the lab stuff and I will show you how to find those. I've embedded those links for you. So now we think about some arthrokinematics of the talocruel joint. So number one, you have to be able to picture the bones. If you can't picture the bones we just talked about, then you're not going to be able to do these arthrokinematics. Remember the rules, and then we'll be able to talk about the actual arthrokinematics. So I'll give you some practice questions here in a little bit. But if we take a quick look at open chain arthrokinematics, This is open chain dorsiflexion. So the foot is moving up towards the tibia. So the talus right here is moving up. So moving superior or anterior, <clears throat> depending on how you wanna look at it. I'm not gonna worry about getting heavily into the semantics here. I'd say the more proper answer is an anterior roll but you can see how if the talus were to continue to roll, it would go all the way up the leg. So what keeps that from happening is the glide. 
And since the talus is convex, if the roll is anterior, the slide or glide has to be back, posterior. That's for open chain dorsiflexion. Now, if we have closed chain dorsiflexion, like when you're sitting down or going down towards the earth in a squat, now we have the tibia and fibula moving forward, but they are concave. So if they're moving anterior, the glide also has to be anterior per the rule. So again, depending on whether it's open or closed chain is gonna determine which bone is moving, thus changing the roll and glide. So let's take a look over here at the open chain plantar flexion. So you, again, you can see that talus here. And if it were to continue to roll, this whole foot is gonna roll up the backside. So we have a posterior roll. And since the talus is convex, we're going to have an anterior glide. If it doesn't glide back this way, then it's just gonna roll up the back of the leg. <clears throat> and then we have the opposite happening when you stand up during a closed chain activity like a squat and we're coming up off away from the ground the tibia and fibula are going to be what's moving and they're going to be rolling back posterior and gliding posterior because they are concave posterior. So I'm gonna go ahead and go down here. I want you to think about what happens when you raise up on your toes? What are the arthrokinematics that's occurring at the MTP joint? So I have this MTP joint. So what's actually occurring when you get up on your toes is extension of the MTP joint. So what are the arthrokinematics for that? So your MTP joint is right here. So if you're up on your toes, your first metatarsal and all the metatarsals are going to be up here. So which way did the head of this metatarsal have to roll? So if you can think about the way this thing is rolling, it's going to go up. So the glide has to be down because it's convex. You can see if we started to roll this piece, if we rolled this piece with that motion, it would keep rolling up and down this toe and just continue to fall off. The glide is what keeps it in place. We'll talk more about that in lab, but those are some little ones to think about, some of those little joints. So that's why you even need to be able to visualize what's happening with a closed chain toe raise versus just extending your toes when your feet are on the floor. So some other important structures we need to look at are the longitudinal arch. This is really important for supporting uh, that foot. So it's comprised of your plantar fascia, the longitudinal and transverse arches of the foot to all help with the arch of the foot itself, the toe flexors and anterior tib, your plantar ligaments or ligament and the posterior tip. All of those things help support the arch. So when we don't have support of the arch or we have um, different variations of arch for people, we have two major ones we would look at here. And that is pes planus versus pes cavus. So pes planus is going to be when someone over pronates their foot. So an example, of that, let's go over to your PowerPoint slides. So right here, we have pes plant, or pronation, I'm sorry. So when you look at this first picture here, this is someone's right foot. Their foot's collapsing in on that arch. So they have a flat arch. Supination is when you're walking on the outside of your foot. Here's another picture here in your PowerPoints. This is still the right foot for both of these. So 
Here you have your pronation, that arch is flattened. And then the arch is really high, the pes cavus. Think of a cave, a big hole that you could drive in. That's what oversupination is gonna do, or pes cavus. Now, it's important to understand the difference between those two and what they can do because they start affecting everything up the chain. So going back to the PowerPoint, we see if you have overpronation, what actually starts to happen is you have valgus starting to happen at the knee. Now we'll talk more about valgus when we get to the knee, but that's when the knee starts to go in. There's an internal rotation of the femur and the hip. And that of course causes a lot of other problems. Um, and we'll talk about that at the knee when we get to the knee. But a low arch in general is gonna reduce your shock absorption uh, of your foot because it's just flat. And then if you have too high of an arch, that doesn't actually help you either because it's not giving it all to, to resist some of that force. So it's just a lot of energy that's getting shot up through the leg because the foot is not absorbing any of that energy. Uh, I have some links that I have on those handouts that I've posted to some of the videos to make sure that you're looking at the open and oops open and closed pack positions of the talocrural joint. So that's what I want to bring attention to plantar flexion for the open pack position. About 10 degrees of plantar flexion. And I want you to think about that as how that's a mechanism of injury for spraining your ankle. Because when you jump, when you come down, you land on your toes first, or like, you know, your metatarsals first. Now you're in a plantar flex state. And that's when a lot of times people sprain their ankles coming down from a jump. Also, if you're wearing any type of heels, that's gonna put you in a plantar flex state as well. And then the closed pack position is about 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. Or the more dorsiflexion you get, the more locked it is. So that's why if you uh, were an athlete and you were getting taped up, usually you try to dorsiflex that foot before getting taped to put it in its most stable position. I do wanna talk about a couple muscles. Uh, the gastrocnemius first, and we need to be able to think about how we can stretch these guys. So how can we stretch these? Well, both of them connect to the Achilles, which connects to the calcaneus. So the ankle needs to get dorsiflexed. So let's go look at a picture here of someone stretching. So this picture on the left, this with the knee extended, this is stretching the gastroc because we're putting the gastroc in its passively insufficient position. Passively insufficient position. The soleus does not insert above the tibia, but the soleus on this right side of picture inserts here. So we need to give some slack to that gastroc. That's why we flex that knee and you're gonna feel more soleus. So what do people stretch the most? The gastroc, that's what most people perform this stretch right here. So what you actually find is a lot of patients have a tight soleus because they never actually stretch it. So we need to make sure we're aware of that so we can stretch either both or find the one that actually needs stretched. Now, both of those are gonna to connect to the Achilles and then connect to the calcaneus. So if there's a tear in the Achilles, there's what's called the Thompson test. The Thompson test, you squeeze the gastroc at the belly of that calf. And if the foot plantar flexes, then they're not positive. But if you squeeze that calf and there's no plantar flexion, then that means it is positive for a severe <laughs> Achilles tendon rupture. So Thompson test is for an Achilles tendon rupture. And that is part one of our ankle. So take a little break there and get ready for video number two.